although he's putting on a brave face, 2006 will go down as a bad year for Rogerio Lobato. Even the cake maker got his birthday wrong. Anniversary 25 7 2116. Following the violence in May, the former interior minister resigned. Tainted by allegations he'd armed a hit squad, and under intense pressure, Prime Minister Mari Alcatiri was forced to resign one month later. According to Rogerio Lobato, a great injustice has occurred. Primeiro ministro, democraticamente eleito, que foi vergonhosamente derrubado por causa de um filme. The film Lobato refers to is the ABC Four Corners program broadcast in June containing the damning hit squad allegations. Lobato has been charged, but despite the very public crucifixion of al Qatiri, there have never been any charges laid against him. I'm fully confident because, as I said, I'm fully aware that I've, I have nothing to do with this, with this kind of thing. On the 23rd of May, Major Alfredo Renardo fired the first shots of this crisis. He was Australian Army trained and was leading a group of rebel soldiers who had split from the army and along with some policemen were now firing on their former colleagues. You shot one? I think so. It's not moving anymore. Renardo insisted that he'd fired in self-defense, but I was there and I clearly saw and heard him shoot first. The soldiers who were fired on that day said the attack against them came out of the blue. Curiously, just days before, politician Leandro Isak, a staunch opponent of Prime Minister al Qatiri, told me that something big was about to happen. I didn't realize how big it was going to get. So why did Major Renardo attack? The former Prime Minister insists that what happened here at Fatuahi was the launch of a premeditated campaign to oust him. I think uh, 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 Alfredo Renardo was instructed to come down to Fatuahi and to restart the, everything with violence. Uh, this is the only way they, they got uh, to provoke everything, to, re, to, to re, restart violence and to justify everything. This was the beginning of four days of chaos in the capital Dili, before the arrival of Australian forces. As a witness to that upheaval, I've come back with colleague John Martinkus, who has covered East Timor for ten years. Following Renardo's opening volley, the second major attack of the crisis was led by a man called Ray Loss. He told Four Corners that he was the leader of the so-called hit squad and was supposed to be killing people on behalf of al -Qatiri. Well, how then does he explain this amateur footage? The man that filmed it told Dateline these are Ray Loss's men and they're fighting alongside the forces they're meant to be killing. They're all fighting the National Army, and by extension, the government of Mari al -Qatiri. But Railos is adamant he didn't join the forces rebelling against al -Qatiri. Bukan gabun. Saya waktu itu saya di sana untuk menghentikan mereka. Jadi saya berikan pengarahan pada mereka. Waktu itu diperintah untuk menghentikan dengan cara kekerasan. Tapi saya masih memakai akal saya untuk menghentikan dengan cara berbicara, berdialog dengan mereka. You'd have to say that taking up arms and firing at the army is an unusual method of dialogue. East Timor's Prosecutor General is still investigating the incident and confirms Railos's role in the fighting in Tasitolu on the outskirts of Dili.
Hmm. So it was confirmed the Raylos men were involved in the fighting in Tatsitolu. Um, they led the attack and they began the shooting. Thank you very much. Just as Alfredo Renardo had started the battle and then withdrawn, so did Raylos. All that's left today of this crucial event in May is a pile of empty cartridge shells. Raylos's claims about his role in the attack raise serious questions about his credibility and his damning allegations against Alcatiri. Over the days that followed, it seemed everyone had a gun, and many of them were handed out by this man, police commissioner and Alcatiri critic Paolo Martins. The commissioner admits to emptying the police armory and distributing all of the weapons just before all the violence began, a fact confirmed by former Prime Minister Mari Alcatiri. Uh, police commander Paolo Martins said me immediately that the weapons were not already on the, on the storage and uh, they were really allocated to, uh, to, to different police units by saying that uh, one of the units was Ailew and the other one in Dili, but in, the, in uh, Likisa. By coincidence or otherwise, the anti alkatiri forces were concentrated in precisely the areas named by Alkatiri. Itu senjata itu yang ditransfer ke Ailew, di mana sekarang? Um... Senjata yang transfer dari Leo di Leo itu sekarang sudah uh, ada di Leo. Di mana? Di URP. It's common knowledge that members of the police reserve unit had joined the rebels along with many civilians. Kenyataannya sampai sekarang siapapun tidak bisa membuktikan bahwa senjata polis ada di tangan orang sipil. If that's the case, how did this police weapon end up in the hands of Leandro Isak? He's a member of East Timor's parliament and he's carrying a police issue Steyr rifle. Karena Timor Leste khususnya kota Dili sudah berada dalam keadaan perang. Perang. Dan ada kata ada nuklir pun saya gunakan nuklir. Mungkin ada yang datang ke sini bertanya-tanya kenapa diputalo parlemen eh uh, mau memakai senjata. Sai lain eh memakai dan memiliki lain sekarang senjata itu sudah ada apa pemiliknya dan bukan saya pemiliknya Pemili pemiliknya siapa polisi yang ada di sini waktu itu the most horrific incident of the four days was the massacre of unarmed police on the 25th of May it was carnage nine police were shot dead and 27 were wounded. All of this done by three soldiers, so the story goes. The UN is investigating the incident. We can offer a dramatically different scenario. This footage suggests there were many more than three soldiers firing. One eyewitness we spoke to claims he saw civilians shooting at the police from these palm trees. And this group of armed men, some of them in civilian clothes, were among many unidentified gunmen at the scene. Who were they? And does the presence of groups like this cast doubt on the accepted version of events? Dateline was told the UN has video evidence supporting the version we have offered. Was this deadly confrontation part of a pattern to discredit the army and further undermine the Prime Minister? With security spiralling out of control in East Timor, Australian troops arrived to more damaging allegations against al Qatiri, which were big news in Australia. East Timor's Prime Minister Murray al Qatiri has today dismissed a string of serious allegations and repeated his claim that a coup is being attempted to force him from power. Forces loyal to Mr al Qatiri have also been accused of massacring 60 unarmed protesters and dumping their bodies in a mass grave. Mr. al Qatiri also stands accused of trying to kill opposition leader Fernando de Araujo. It's just a completely false. 
uh, I think that this this part, this uh, kind of allegation or accusation, is part of the whole plan, uh, trying to trying to demonize me. But nothing uh, uh, is true. It's a complete or false. True or false, Australia apparently took the threat against opposition leader Fernando Araujo very seriously. They flew his wife and son to Darwin on two Black Hawk helicopters from this isolated airport in the southwest of the country. She arrived just in time to make the Australian news bulletin. Um, like in Australia, where you can speak and you can debate and the ruling party doesn't burn down your house and threaten to kill you. It's worth noting that neither the death threats nor the allegations of mass graves have ever been proved. While Australia protected Araujo's family, many East Timorese say his Democratic Party, or PD, is actually responsible for coordinating the anti alcatiri mobs. But you, you provide the trucks to drive them into town? I mean, PD is is involved in organising the transport to bring these people in. So I think this is the two, for demonstration, this is his people right. But when they, he, he burn house, this is a crime. Should be arrested. And bring to Israel, it's not my, it's not my responsibility. And Araujo had plenty of help stirring up anti al qatiri sentiment. <laughs> Take for instance Rui Lopez, a man made wealthy through his close connections with Kopassus, the notorious Indonesian Special Forces. When Dateline went looking for Rui Lopez, we found he had crossed the border into Indonesia. It's a shame Rui Lopez wasn't at home. Basically, he's had lots of meetings with those people. He as far as we know, provides money and logistic support to the PD party. And what we wanted to ask him was where the money was coming from. Oh, so I say I never get any money from, from, from Rui, Rui Lopez. Uh, actually, we have the same uh, view that Mari uh, threatened this country, but we all together. We organized that demonstration together. Another of Arujo's associates and supporters is Nemesio de Carvalho. He's a former leader of one of the most bloodthirsty militia that terrorized Timor during 1999. De Carvalho is under house arrest for his militia activities. So, Rui Lopez, I and other people. And according to me now, most Timorese is against Fretilin. Uh, are against Fretilin. Are against Fretilin. Because uh, Fretilin is undemocratic. Another influential player in this drama is the Catholic Church. The church was openly opposed to al qatiri and his government, as this April 2005 letter shows. The citizens of this country don't identify with the model that this government wants to impose on Timorese society. It's completely alien and cut off from the roots of our cultural, social and historic realities. Both of East Timor's bishops signed and sent it to the President of Parliament asking that they decide on the immediate removal of the current Prime Minister, Dr al Qatiri, and his government, and the appointment of a new Prime Minister who would immediately form a government. The letter was ignored. But the Church have apparently been involved in more than letter writing. Reliable sources in the Army High Command told Dateline that two priests personally urged them to oust al Qatiri. Father Apollinario was one of them. No, is that correct? Is that true? No, I no? can't say anything. No, but is it, is it true you went to visit to talk or not? No. Bishop Ricardo da Silva 
a co-signatory of the letter, also wasn't too keen to discuss the church's alleged approaches to the army, or FFDTL. True, not true, not true. Is it? <laughs> People don't understand everything. Not true. No, not bad. Okay. Th thank you. Thank you very much, Bishop. Take care. I'll see you sometime. And you. Thank you. Uh, it means that uh, what they couldn't do at that time, do, they decided to plan it better and to do it in a, to do it in a different way. Uh, I don't think that the, the, we can we can really blame the church as an institution. And there was more, according to top-level army sources, in late 2005, armed forces chief Brigadier General Taur Matanruak and Lieutenant Colonel Falur Rate Lake were approached by two Timorese leaders accompanied by two foreigners. On two separate occasions, the four also asked the army, or FFDTL, to remove Prime Minister al -Qatiri. Again, the FFDTL refused. I was aware, I was informed by, by the, some commanders of the FFDTL on the situation that were, that they were approached by some Timorese and some foreign nationals. But uh, I was fully aware and confident on the, on the command of the army. That's why I think that it was not an issue that can wo could worry me. Uh, and for me, it was nothing. The two foreign nationals who were involved in approaching the military here to convince them to mount a coup against you, were they Australian? Even the commander, they were not clear on this, if they were Australian or American, but it's between these two. But uh, I still have no uh, clear information from the, uh, the command that they were Australian or American, but surely uh, they were an English speaking. So who would want to mount a coup in East Timor and why? Murray al says it's simply because he was too independent and threatened Australian interests in the oil and gas fields of the Timor Sea. What I've been uh, doing during my terms is uh, to defend the interests of my people on having the resources to develop this country independently, not to be dependent. Uh, this is the only thing, and I was fully aware that uh, we had our right, we still have our right on the, on the Timor Sea, and we need to defend it. Not, not because I'm anti-Australian. I like very, very much Australia as a country, as a nation, as a people. Uh, and I'm, I will never be anti-Australian. Do you have any evidence that um, Australia was at some level involved in the effort to seek your resignation? And evidence, no, but uh, the f only prime minister in the world that was really advising me, quote unquote, to, uh, to step down was the prime minister of Australia during these this days, these difficult days. Jenny, how are you? How are you? John Howard, on the other hand, is far more disposed to Al Qatiri's replacement as prime minister, Jose Ramos Horta. It is this new agreement brings with enormous potential and opportunity for Timor Leste and Australia. Thank you for your attention. Obrigado, Barrett. Just days after being sworn in, new PM Ramos Horta presided over the historic signing of the first oil production sharing contract between the two countries. Thank you, and uh, may God bless you all. Thank you. When you deal with oil and gas and economics, well, you have to be fair and realistic, pragmatic. You know, Australia cannot be always philanthropic in everything it does conduct with East Timor. I asked Ramos Horta's energy minister, Jose Teixeira, whether he thought that East Timor was getting a fair deal in the lucrative oil and gas agreements. It's not the, uh, the ideal outcome, but it's the pragmatic outcome. It's the creative solution to, 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 um, to get a, give, give us an outcome. It seems pragmatism has won the day. But the former Prime Minister says he wanted to ensure East Timor had greater control over its natural resources, particularly the Greater Sunrise oil and gas field. 
what I've been doing up to now is really try to get uh, some independent study of uh, the feasibility, uh, independent feasibility study of uh, getting the pipeline to Timor Leste and the LNG plant to Timor Leste. And this is very important because uh, what Australia is trying to, 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 to achieve is to have uh, again sunrise to be sent to, to, to Darling. It's not about this is Australian interest, but my interest uh, can never, uh, can, can't, can't be always coincident with Australian interest and, and vice versa. Uh, this is the reality. In the midst of the crisis, today there's a media event being staged at President Shanana Gushmal's house. He's taking local journalists on a tour of his much-loved garden. So gardening is one way you can forget the troubles. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Shanana Gushmal is the man who holds the greatest moral influence in East Timor and is often portrayed as staying above the political fray. But this murky affair, with its many unanswered questions, has seen him at the very centre of events. In March this year, in a nationally televised address, he responded to the recent split in the country's army, speaking out about discrimination against recruits from the west of the country. Whatever the president's intentions, his words had immediate effect. That very night, the first Easterners' homes were burned down, and the first refugees fled their homes. Many felt that the president had taken sides with East Timorese from the west of the country, who are mostly anti al -Kateri. And again today, he's very proactive. On his front doorstep, literally, two guns and a man who said he got them off the former interior minister. This media event draws an intriguing cast of characters, including Rai Loss, whose hit squad allegations brought down the Prime Minister. Rai Loss is warmly received by the President. But as we pointed out earlier, Rai Loss attacked the National Army, which under the Constitution is headed by President Guzmao. <laughs> Kirsty Sword Gushmal is East Timor's Australian-born First Lady. In May, she was quoted in the Australian newspaper saying that al Qatiri should resign. Many here regarded her comments as symbolic of Australian meddling. There was some rather mischievous misquoting that was done by the Australian newspaper. Um, I actually didn't call for release. Uh, resignation, I commented on the fact that there were increasingly um, uh, forceful demands for him to, to resign, mm -hmm. but I didn't express any personal opinion on, you know, well, on that that's issue, the, but that's, that's the, the way, way it was, it was yeah. And it's been picked up here as a sort of in, a, a meddling in, a, an Australian intervention or meddling in the internal affairs of his team. Yeah. Mm. No, it was a misquote. Some people are suggesting that what happened was Australia's first coup. What do you say to that? Uh, no, I already told people that we are aware of our own mistakes. Mm -hmm. We are very aware of our own, our own uh, doings, wrongdoings, and the good things. We are well, well aware of this. So the, the coup is, is, is just... Uh, <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Dateline made multiple requests for an extended interview with President Gushmal, but he declined. He's the boss in the struggle, and now he gets nothing. This symbolic rule, according to our constitution. Whatever his motivations, Nemesio de Carvalho, the former militiaman, well, is prepared uh, to say what many uh, East Timorese now believe but are afraid to spell out. That the president and or others wanted al removed and the only way to achieve it was through drastic means. There must be crisis and stability, including war, so he can 
play. They can play in such a situation. Without conflict, without instability, without anarchy, war, maybe he will never get more power. There's also a lot of people, like, much of it in, in whispers, saying that the president is behind all of this stuff. There's bound to be comments like that made. Um, I can say with absolute confidence as an insider, as someone who's accompanied very closely this whole situation, that it's nothing but a load of codswallop. Meanwhile, 150,000 East Timorese sit in refugee camps, waiting for their leaders to sort out the mess. <laughs> 